My name is Rochelle Newton, and I am uh, operating uh, manager at Duke Health. And presenting with me today is Drew Stennett, who is the end all and know all of everything is to know about technology. Drew, uh, I, I appreciate that intro. <laughs> Uh, Drew, Drew works on Central IT at Duke, and I work in the health system. So we are going to talk to you today about Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. And when I submitted this presentation to Todd and Danny, I got a bunch of question marks. So they thought we were going to watch the children's movie. Um, but I want to know, how many of you have seen the movie? And can you just say, you know, raise your hand or something and... Uh, the moderator, can you please tell us how many people have seen Charlie and the Chocolate Factory? Sure, yeah, you can use the chat. People can use the chat and just say that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it looked like about like half or so of the attendants had a had a had a hand going up. So very yeah. very well known movie. That's good. Absolutely. So why would you think that we would have this movie as our 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 talk for ATO? What, why do you think this is uh, important or relevant? And you can say it either in the uh, chat or you can say uh, you can tell the moderator however you wish you do it. <laughs> New tech is like That's a good candy. One. Hey, how are you, Kelly? <laughs> So I, I will tell you. So uh, many people, as I have, uh, have I, as I have talked about this, uh, many people have missed um, that little small subtle piece of the movie that had nothing to do with Charlie, the factory, or candy. Um, if you remember how the movie starts, uh, the father, the breadwinner, Mr. Bucket, is working in the factory at the chocolate factory. And along the way, Charlie discovers, I mean, uh, the, the factory owner discovers that the secrets are leaking out of his company and other people are making his products. So he decides one day he's gonna fire everyone and just run the factory through some means that wasn't obviously clear to us in the beginning. But Mr. Buckets lost his job through no fault of his own only because his job could be automated. And if you paid attention to that, when you get to near the end of the movie, Mr. Bucket gets his job back. Drew, why does he get his job back? Because uh, somebody has to fix those robots. The robots don't run themselves. <laughs> He's fixing the automation bits that automated himself out of the job, which is uh, uh, fairly interesting. And in, in a lot of ways, I think we as technologists feel like that's what we're doing is we're sort of fixing these robots that are uh, probably going to replace us all in the long run, but something's still got to fix them. Absolutely. And so the theme in the movie is this golden ticket. So who is going to get this golden ticket and win this special prize? And if you've seen the movie, you know, the special prizes, uh, uh, the factory owner is, he, he discovers he has a gray hair and he needs to have an heir to leave his, his, his company to. What's really idyllic about this story, the way it's told, is you see so many versions of innovation, some of it unreal and some of it real, but so many versions of innovation. So the flying elevator, um, do we ever think that will become a thing? I, I would vote yes. Um, if you are a Star Trek fan like I am, you know, a lot of the technology in Star Trek has somehow made its way to, uh, to everyday life. And so, yeah. the goal go ahead, Drew. Oh, no, I was just going to say, yeah, the, uh, the other thing that I sort of liked about this was even the, the candy itself was sort of technology advanced, like, uh, you know, all the little innovations they're doing, that's uh, a, a lot of parallels to our, to our current technology. And even having like being replaced by a robot at the time, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory was written. I don't think they were actually replacing anybody with robots, but now it's a, a very, very real thing. Absolutely. And the golden ticket for us today is innovation, automation, and these emerging technologies. 
and, and how does that look for the future of work? So if you've been in information technology or STEM science, technology, engineering, math, and medicine, you've seen a lot of innovations happen uh, over the last few years. So the future of work for those of us that work in technology, for the most part, is pretty secure, right? Because STEM fields have very low unemployment. You know, there's not a great deal of turnover unless we're, you know, chasing money, you know, we may change jobs, but for the most part, we're pretty stable and we don't see a lot of, you know, hiccups in, in the job market for our work. There are some parts of our jobs that pay more and some that pay less, but for the most part, it's pretty stable. But when we go back to Mr. Bucket, we can make an assumption that Mr. Bucket was an ordinary Joe, right? Working an ordinary job, manual labor, you know, screwing tops on toothpaste, you know, just an ordinary guy. And for reasons not his own fault, he loses his job. What's not said in Charlie and the Chocolate Factory is what he had to do to get the job back to fix the machine, as Drew mentioned. And so when we think about these emerging technologies, think about the ones that you know that are poised to disrupt jobs in, a, in the world. So as a result of COVID, what do we like 21, 22 million people are unemployed right now? And that's simply because of a pandemic. But what happens when we're on the other side of that pandemic and companies who were hurt by this pandemic then has to figure out how to get their financial footings back? So will they consider human beings or will they consider automation? So Drew, when you think about that, what are the thoughts that you think about, you know, where we are in this pandemic and the state of our economy? Uh, that's a great question. Um, I mean, I think automation is going to be key in getting a lot of these things back online, just because as people are consuming less, as we're all staying at home, that's going to be less money flowing back into the economy. And that means, you know, it, it's going to be harder for, uh, everybody to both get jobs and keep those jobs. And I think for every, I think everybody's also gonna feel the burn of we have to do more with less, right? Like uh, even if folks are keeping their jobs, jobs may not be, you know, people aren't gonna be hiring as much. Uh, there's just gonna be, there's gonna be a whole lot to do. And for better or worse, I think focusing on things like automation and having, you know, robots I say robots, I don't always mean like a mechanical arm that's gonna come out and twist a, twist a toothbrush uh, cap on, but uh, you know, things that don't require human interaction are gonna be way, are gonna continue to grow in importance uh, everywhere. Absolutely. And so for those of you who are uh, shoppers, um, I am not particularly, but uh, I often tell the story of Sam. Sam's Club is one of my favorite stores. And it's not because they sell things in bulk, but it's because I never have to talk to a person from the minute I walk in the door to the minute I walk out. I can scan everything on my phone. I click a button, I pay, I get a QR code, put it up against the wall and I walk out. Now, as a black woman, I should not be excited about that because if you pay any attention to traditional retail, black and brown people are the predominant people in those roles. So my excitement to not have to deal with a person stems from my introvertedness. But the other part is, you know, the scanning and, and paying and waiting in line behind masses of people is time consuming for me. So I want to hurry up and come home so I don't have to talk to anybody. So there is this thing to think about these things. So everything that you can possibly think of. So I'll give you another one of those examples. I've had my third rotator cuff surgery. This very last surgery I had in January of this year, a robot did it, not a person. And because the, what they needed to do was so delicate, they didn't trust human hands to do that. So as we think about these emerging technologies, my doctor, my, my ortho doctor uh, has worked on Coach K, if you follow Duke basketball, many uh, Kobe Bryant, many important people who have orthopedic issues but with all the skill and experience that he has, a robot needed to do the job that was there. And if you think about all the industries that are, are subject to automation or emerging technologies, there's a lot. McKinsey, there was a McKinsey report that said by 
2030, 50% of all the job classifications we know today will be replaced by automation, innovation, or some other kind of technology, but will not be done by a person. So I'm going to ask you again, Drew, going back about the economy. So now that we've gotten maybe half of our population slashed out of jobs, what are the steps that they should be thinking about right now before we get there? Uh, so one thing that I know that I've tried to focus on as far as the technology, as far as technology has gone, is trying to be one of those people that I would say that fixes the machines or that automates the automation, right? Like as technologists, some of the, I would say the boring stuff is the first stuff to get automated, right? And so as you're, nobody wants their job to be totally automated. So try and find ways to automate it yourself and make yourself valuable uh, in that way, because you really have to, you really have to be doing something uh, unique and valuable, not just screwing lids onto uh, toothpaste tubes. You know, those lids need to be screwed on, but if it can be automated, uh, try and be the one automating it, I guess is sort of the, the lesson that I've tried to take away over the last 10 years or so. Right, so retooling your, your tool bag, right? So we all are good at what we do, right? So the things that we've learned and we've acquired this knowledge of, we are very good at this. And we, you know, go to conferences or take a class or something to re, re, reaffirm our skills, but we're pretty good at it. But imagine if you had to fix the tooth the toothbrush screwer topper robot and you've never had any experience with that. And so for marginalized groups, you know, once you're in a career, typically you like to stay in that career and you believe you have enough wherewithal to be successful in that career. But with emerging technologies, sitting comfortably in our seats is going to be a bit challenging. And I'm going to read something to you. I, this wouldn't fit on my screen, but on um, my uh, PowerPoint, but I want to share this. So here are some things that are likely to be disrupted. Travel websites and the need for humans to schedule travel. Did you think about that? How about tax software? How many of you do turbo tax to do your taxes? Newspapers, gone. No people in the newsroom anymore. Language transition, translation. So Google Translate and there are a gazillion others, gone. Secretaries, phone operators, executive assistants, and all of those fancy titles, gone. Financial prof professionals, your tax accountants, your, your uh, trust uh, uh, folks, gone, because it can be done through automated systems. Job recruiters, gone. Uber, Lyft, replaces taxi cabs, livery drivers, and anything else. Driverless cars replace truck drivers, chauffeurs, whatever you can imagine, that's out there. Drone technology, Amazon will no longer bring their nice Mercedes truck on your street and drop your package off. They're gonna drone it onto your street. 3D printing, so instead of having something manufactured or created in, 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 in a factory, such as a car, 3D printing will make, make its way to the point where you can go somewhere, punch in some codes, and your car will be made by this 3D printer. Now, I imagine it's got to be a pretty big 3D printer, but a 3D printer. Assembly line workers, gone. Robots replacing. You can see that every day. Now, if you go to the Coca-Cola Coca factory, you can see it every single day. It's a, a robot that's putting the Coke and tightening it up and putting it in the box and moving it. Postal workers gone, which means that we won't have any more postal students. No one can go postal anymore unless they're a robot. <laughs> Fast foods, right? So how many of you been to McDonald's re recently and there's a kiosk right there that you go in there and put your order and you pay and the food just drops out the slot right there. That's the one near me. That's what happens. Toll booth attendance, gone. Radio DJs, gone. Professors, teachers, gone. Television programming, Cable, gone. Streaming services have taken over. Spotify and iTunes replaced the music industry. Libraries and librarians, gone. Farmers and ranchers, gone. All of this because of emerging technologies. So Drew, knowing all of this, what are your thoughts about 
how this will look in the new world that we're, we're going into. How will this look post COVID? How will this look you know, in an economy that's less based on tangible things and more intangible things? Well, you know, it, it's funny, like, as you mentioned all of those things, I think probably everybody here in this meeting has like family, friends, uh, even coworkers that are affected in those industries and them being gone is, I mean, it, it sucks. And it's, uh, it's something that's uh, very true and it really hits home for everybody. Uh, my dad used to work in the newspaper business and he's retired now, but he told us, he gives a, an analogy of how when the internet really began to blow up, everybody in the newspaper room was like, hey, we see this atomic bomb that went off <laughs> way over there in the distance. And we know that blowback is going to come and hit us and decimate us. And we just want to like make it as, as long as we can. But, you know, there's no way, you know, there's no running from that mushroom cloud that's coming. Uh, there's no shielding yourself. Uh, you know, it's coming. You, you can't stop. You can't really stop technology. It's gonna. It's gonna overtake you, and it's gonna overtake you. And you know, for better or worse, that's what's gonna happen. Uh, one thing that uh, that I really try and do, and that I, I think is helpful, and one thing that I noticed in the Charlie and the Chocolate Factory movie is that Mr. Bucket and uh, even Grandpa their personalities and their names are so tied to their profession and the chocolate factory that when those jobs get decimated, it also decimates them as a family. And uh, I think that's, it's something that's very hard. Like I think of Mr. Bucket, Bucket as a tool, you know, he, he's named after a tool and he's just going in and doing this job every day. And that made me think like, well, what if my name was like, not Drew Stinnett, but Drew Linux or, you know, Drew Vim. And all of a sudden that tool is no longer necessary. Does that mean that, you know, me as a person is no longer necessary? Uh, it doesn't, but it does mean that I'm gonna need to be conscious about pivoting to something else. And also like knowing that's okay. You know, if the Linux world, if technology pivots and Linux is no longer something that is useful for the community or it gets, you know, taken over by something else, I don't want my name tied into that old outdated technology. I want to be able to move to something else, whatever that, uh, whatever that next thing is. And like you mentioned how, uh, you know, as technology is moving, we can't really settle in and get comfortable with our existing tech because all of the existing tech today, it's as bad as it's gonna get, it's only gonna get better. So as you're staying still, you're really sort of moving backwards. So you always have to be thinking about moving forward. Uh, you know, if you have that downtime in your day, because I'm sure everybody has tons of downtime in their day, <laughs> you know, uh, it, it's easy to think, oh, let me just sit and take a breath and relax a little bit. But a lot of times that's good for uh, learning those new technologies and making sure you're not, you know, sitting idle, having technologies move ahead of you when you need to be holding on to that wave and keeping up. Absolutely. And I think what's important for all of you developers and open source gurus and all those things is to think about the communities that will be affected by the technologies that you put forth out there. So um, many of you may remember the Equifax uh, hack. How many of you are Equifax customers? Zero. But the bank you deal with, your credit card, whatever it is, is a customer of Equifax. So Equifax did a, a well, okay job of trying to put your mind at ease. You know, they offered credit monitoring, you know, I think they offered some small uh, amount of money, um, but there were 38, I think it was percent of the population did, did not know what had happened, what that meant. So there's the unbanked, the underbanked, the unfamiliar, the uneducated, the unknowing, world of money. So we all go to sleep at night because we go to the nice bank and we put our paycheck in there and it sits there until we need it. There's a large segment of the population that still puts their money under the mattress. You know, so if the house burns down, there goes their money. But what's really important about these things that you are developing, they need to be in English speak, not tech speak. Because if you are a great technologist and you have great ideas and you know how to do all these things, how 
fast or how well would that reach the entire marketplace? And if you compare Microsoft to Apple in the early days, DOS was as complex of a language that I had ever seen in my life. And I had done assembly F, I did Fortran, I did COBOL, I understood that. But when I encountered DOS, I was completely perplexed. Whereas when I encountered the Apple operating system, it was almost seamless. When you're thinking about developing these automated tools, you need to think about who you're developing them for. What's ironic about Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, he had a market out there, a huge market of people who won his go goods, but he shut them out. He said, you're stealing my secrets. I don't want you in my factory. I don't want you around me. I'm gonna go find these other people to do this as such. What's not clear in that movie is what happened to that base, his consumer base when he did that. So the people who he fired, did he lose them as customers? So as you are developing technology and thinking about technology, think about it from the perspective of not from the chair you sit in, but the chair that's facing you. Who's going to buy your products? Who's going to hire you to do their work? Do you speak enough plain speak that you get your message across? So my next slide is unemployment, right? So you can imagine that with these emerging technologies and innovation and all those things, some people are going to lose their jobs. And Drew talked about that a little bit. We have to start thinking about this, not just for ourselves, but for them as well. Because for the people that are losing their jobs and may not be able to find another job, how are they going to survive? What do you think their options are going to be? So will we have social socialized programs? Will we have more um, government supported options? Or will we think about how to bring these people along with us? So one of the things that I, 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 I like best about myself is I am an advocate. I do not believe I belong by myself. If I can help someone else along the way, that's how I, I get my joy at the end of the day. And as technologists, you should embrace that idea too, because there's an old school of thought that says, if you know it, you can teach it. Teach someone else how to retool their tool bag if they haven't figured it out. So Drew, um, you might wanna tell them about your work at Duke and, and I will give you a little hint. So when we were still in the building, Drew came to various parts of the university with a team and he taught us something new all the time. So Drew, would you talk about that a little bit? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, it, it's funny you mentioned that because a lot of times I feel like I'm more of a sponge than a fountain, but uh, this reminds me of more of a fountain time. So, <laughs> uh, so the way Duke is set up is we have, uh, we have schools, we have a school of law, we have Duke law, we have, you know, different department, I would call them almost like departments that are outside of central IT. And within central IT, I would say we do a lot of cool stuff, but a lot of times the cool stuff that we do doesn't necessarily translate out to departments. And I'll use like law for as an, as an example, because uh, while Rochelle and I might talk, you know, we don't always talk about specific technologies. We don't talk about what central IT is doing. Uh, so we would have little, uh, uh, I would call them about once every month or once every two months, because a lot of times I forget to uh, schedule them or get lazy and don't schedule them. <laughs> but uh, we would just have these information sharing sessions where we would get a group of us together and we would focus on a topic, whether it was uh, OpenShift or GitLab or any sort of technology that uh, one group has found interesting. And I think it worked it worked really well because it gave us an excuse to to talk about these things like a lot of times in central IT we'll find a cool technology and we don't really know how to get that out to everyone else we'll use it ourselves and it's great and you know I think a lot of times we get in our lane and that's great we use it ourselves that's fine but there are so many people outside of our group that can use it like you know law or any of the schools and so having that uh you know if they weren't long meetings we would just meet around lunch for a couple hours and just talk about something and i think that was a really good way to sort of get that knowledge out there like we don't need we as central it don't need to 
you know, do a tutorial on this is how you program and this is how you edit and this is exactly how you deploy everything. But we can at least start planting those seeds and just get the ideas out there and let people know, hey, this cool thing that I'm doing in my group, maybe your group can use it as well. And then maybe when your group finds something cool, you'll let us know about it and we can use it as well. Because no one group can know everything. And like Rochelle said, being an advocate is a being an advocate for your group is a real, I think it's a great thing. And so through this, we uh, we formed a team of, I don't know, 10, 20 people. And I think it's a really good resource for uh, sharing ideas. And back when we could actually eat lunch together, we would all go out to lunch and talk about new things and, you know, just sort of form this bond between technologists that uh, was super helpful. And again, I want to point out, like you said, Rochelle, uh, being an advocate for other people, I think that's very valuable because a lot of times we're all just sort of, you know, like we get down, we get at our desk, we want to focus on what we're doing, don't care about, you know, what's going on in the outside world. When by helping people in the outside world, you're also helping yourself because you're creating this network that will, you can support it and it can support you uh, when you need it. Absolutely. And, and going back to Charlie and the cho chocolate factory. So the five kids that found the golden tickets, instead of working together collectively, they worked on their own individual interests and it turned out to hurt them in the shortfall. It is important that we remember we are gifted to be technologists. How we got here, we got here, but we are here. And so as you see the world change in front of you, it is incumbent upon each of you to find someone to bring with you. It is incumbent that you teach others what you know, whether you teach them through a traditional class or whether you have a cup of coffee and you have a conversation with them. And one of the wonderful things about Drew, Drew is very, very, very shy and, and not very, he doesn't brag about himself, but Drew is, is brilliant, he really is. And any of y'all looking for a genius, Drew is your guy, but I'm sure Duke doesn't want to part with him. But it's important to have a Drew in your organization, someone who is willing to take his or her time and bring a technology to a group and have a Q&A, give an overview, and then serve as a resource if there are further questions. So when GitHub, we first had GitHub, Drew is the person who brought GitHub to us, Docker, you know, and all of these things, Drew was responsible for bringing himself and others to talk with uh, the team and actually do there are 45 of us, you know, and talk with us about what he knows and what he thinks is important for us to know. And that is an example of a well-rounded technologist. It's not just he's in there getting his paycheck, doing the best job he can get, and then saying, oh, well, I can go home at the end of the day, but he's bringing others along. And it's important to bring others along because as you've seen in Charlie in the Chocolate Factory, the separation of those five children and their parents led to doom and only one succeeded because he had a giving sense to him as opposed to a selfish or um, I want only me to win kind of thing. I keep harping on underserved groups because I think it's important for us to understand. Um, I think I, I can speak this for myself, but I think for other black and brown people and for some women in, 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 in IT and STEM, we are severely underrepresented we are not paid equally, we aren't promoted equally, we struggle to find our voice. And in a lot of cases, these technologies that are coming along are gonna harm these very same people. So if you take things like algorithms, so if you live in a certain zip code, there is a chance that your zip code is going to be list, listed as high risk or crime ridden or something, so your insurance rates are gonna be more, more you pay. These are all things that like open source can address. We all know that there's bias in technology. You know, there was a discussion at Duke um, a couple, three weeks ago about the terms in technology that are racist, if you will. So whitelisted versus blacklisted, you know, or slave and master for a hard drive to a CPU, all of these kinds of words the issues that exist deep inside our society come out through our, our resources. So whether it's technology, whether it's uh, housing, all of those, it makes itself known 
in various ways. So it's critically important that we understand, you know, how important it is to bring other groups into the fold so that we aren't creating bias that that ends up hurting people, right? So, you know, and I and talked about this yesterday in my chat a little bit, but you all know Google had their facial recognition software. And when it encountered a skin tone it wasn't familiar with, it produced a picture of a gorilla. That's not Google intending to be racist or harmful. That's Google only having a certain kind of people coding and creating these resources so they code and do what they know. And as has been said many, many times, the algorithms, the automations, the robots, the data only produce what the people who created it have enabled it to produce. So if you write code that has bias in it, it's going to have a biased result. If you write code that has discrimination or racism in it, it's going to come out that way. We must focus on making sure that the code and the data and the automation is fair, creates a fair play for everyone. So, Absolutely. Uh, I, I just wanted to add to that, like, uh, one thing that we've been trying to do, I know, like, you know, I've been in technology for 20 or so years, and like the master-slave uh, terminology, uh, blacklist and whitelist, that stuff is like ingrained in our brains. And until recently, we'd never really pushed to change that. And I, I would really encourage everybody here to, you know, you probably have products with whitelist and blacklist, master and slave in there. And I think as we try and root that stuff out, it really gives us like uh, a couple advantages. One, you know, it gets that terminology out of technology, but the other thing, it gets people, people talking about it and it makes people more aware of it. And I think, you know, I won't say which one is better. I think they're both very important, but being able to bring it to people's consciousness and say, hey, you realize you named the server like master and we've been naming it like this for 20 years. Maybe it's time we change that and just, you know, throwing it out there and having people be aware that this is a problem where, you know, for years, myself included, we just didn't think about that. And, you know, maybe it's maybe it's time we do better and maybe it's time we get that stuff totally out of technology. Right. And there are much, there are many more words than just those four that are that are in the tools. And I think that, you know, as you think about the, the things you're developing in the work that you're working on, you know, can you think about it in a more utopian kind of way? And and the way I try to describe this is like when you think about the universe, you know, the universe has a gazillion trees, a gazillion flowers, all kinds of bugs and ants and stuff. It's not just one. So why we are fixated on something being better than another. So being white, being better than being black or being Latino or Hispanic or being Asian, that flies in the face of the universe. The universe is diverse. It's the most diverse thing out there. There's nothing more diverse. In my yard, I have at least 11 different kinds of trees and they seem to live very harmoniously together. They don't seem to be fighting. One isn't trying to kill the other one or stomp out its roots. They're all right there doing fine, trying to see which of them can stand closest to the sun, but they live together harmoniously. Why can't we? So as you look at these slides I'm putting in, I'm happy to share them with you if you like. I will send them to whoever wishes to have a copy. But, you know, and you think about these things, we, what what you see here in this slide, right? So you see the disparity between groups, right? You see the problem between groups. The slide I put up earlier, you see what the unemployment numbers look like, right? So you see all these things. So as you are doing the work that you do, as you are thinking about the work that you do, you should be thinking about the way to make the world better and not to create separation and dissension because united, is a very powerful word. And what Drew does is he unites people. He brings people together to unite around a common good. And I think that is such a rewarding thing for us to do as a society, especially considering how much power we will have in the near term. Those of us that are technologists will have immense power be in, in demand, you know, be able to ask for whatever we want to pay because as these industries start transitioning from this to that, we then get to a place where we are able to see a world 
that is a better world for everyone. We don't have people that are hungry. We don't have gas shortages. We don't have people being evicted. We're creating a world where there is, you know, harmony and equality. I'll say one other thing about women. It is important. It is absolutely centrally important that women be included in our thought processes. Because right now for every dollar a man makes, a woman makes 79 cents. That's the most illogical thing I could ever imagine. If you got the same education, same experience, why are you paid less? If we're doing it based on some agrarian idea or some concept of what a woman used to be, we're not there and we need to move forward with that. Women code, women design, women work in technology and STEM, the whole nine yards, we should be paid equally. And, I, and, and Charlie and the Chocolate Factory for me is one of those kinds of pay attention kind of things. You know, it's, it's something you need to think about because Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, although it's a kid's movie, you know, it's not meant to be serious or anything, but it is certainly a prelude to what's coming. And if you aren't aware, you better start looking out because it's coming and it's coming fast. So if you're currently just screwing the top on the, the toothpaste, they're gonna find a way to automate that and get rid of you. Because what COVID has told us more than anything else, any business that could survive without humans survived. Those essential workers were essential and they are you know, experiencing trauma from COVID. Companies are gonna sit back after this is over and think, how can we do this better? And so all of you technologists and designers and DevOps and scrum masters and all these other people, you're gonna be in demand. I hope you will, design yourself to be equitable and think about everybody fairly. Uh, I, um, I've done talking all I want to talk about. So Drew, would you want to bring us home? Tell us uh, what we missed and what else we need to know. <laughs> so the only thing I wanted to, uh, to add to what uh, you said, Rochelle, is uh, again, like, thank you for all the, com the compliments. I'm super humbled by that and really appreciate it. Uh, while I do feel like I bring a lot to you all, uh, when you do these, when you do this sort of outreach, when you go and talk to people, it's very rewarding for the person doing the outreach as well, right? Like sharing something like GitLab or Docker, for me, that's pretty easy and it has a big impact and that's great. And the thing that I really liked about, uh, I will call it outreach, is that you get to meet people like Rochelle. Like Rochelle, I don't know if we would have ever uh, met and formed this sort of friendship if not for these uh, for these meetings. And I feel like that has paid off the you know minimal amount of hours spent doing outreach has paid off you know by way more. <laughs> Just uh, meeting people like you and everyone else in the group and getting uh, getting a new perspective. And I think the new perspective is. Uh, is very important. Um, when you talk about uh, making sure that uh, women and minorities have a seat at the table, I also want to add that like, it's not just the job of women and minorities to get that spot at the table. A lot of times, you know, in our diversity group at Duke, one recurring thing that I hear is like, hey, I was in this meeting with leadership and I was the only person that looked like me at that table. And unfortunately, like my thought is like, oh, you should have been at the meeting before then because you weren't there. And it was like 100% white men, right? Like it's not, uh, we can do a lot better. Like we need to be diverse and it's not, I'll speak for, I'll speak for white men everywhere. Like we need to be bringing people to the table. We don't need to wait for people to force them way, force their way to the table, which is where, you know, they deserve and have a right to be. So if you're in meetings where you notice it's not diverse, uh, don't wait for someone else to do it. Like bring it up, try and bring more people to the table because diversity helps uh, helps everybody. And it's, it's very important all around. And, you know, not just for the people that have been uh, systemically kept down, but it'll help your group. It'll help you be better people. It'll help you bring new technologies to the plate and it'll help you bring, it'll help you, uh, it'll give you ideas that your group hasn't thought of before because your group is not diverse. Exactly. So we have time for a few questions if there are any. Yes. Thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Newton and 
And thank you, you too, uh, for, such an, for such an interesting, interesting talk. We have a couple of questions. I'm going to allow Brent Deming Men to ask his question if he if he's still there. Um, <clears throat> all right. Brent. All right, so if Brent is taking time, let me read out the question from the Q&A. It says, how much of this can we eliminate by changing the social view that someone is only entitled to food and shelter if they have a job, instead of advocating for reskilling in the status quo, that the future of work is less about survival, but interest. So I, I think yeah. that we, we, we must first try to dissect what we think we are as a society. Um, so if we believe in a hierarchical society that something has to be better than another, nothing we do in technology will be fair, nothing. If we want there to be a fair and equitable industry, ours is the one because we know so much about our work and what can and cannot be done in our work that we must then start to look at it and find the places where we see the dark spots and clarify those and make it clear that we don't want this to continue. We want to pay people. We want to bring people to the table. We want to, when we hire, we want to hire not just someone because of their color or their gender or their sexual orientation, but because it brings something to the table. It makes everyone at the table better. Thank you. Hey, one you thing I'm sort of curious about what you think, Rochelle, is that one thing that comes up at times with uh, automation is, uh, is putting a tax on uh, robots that replace workers. And I'm curious if you had any thoughts on that. I wrote an article about this not too long ago. So um, someone said, you know, well, robots is free labor. And, and it brought to mind enslaved people, right? So free labor, you know, so it's not something I'm particularly comfortable with. But I do think that companies that are able to think about their innovation in a way that reduces costs for individuals, make sound decisions in the way they do it, for example, application tracking systems. I'm sure we, everyone here has looked for a job at some point in time. And if you've and it's been so in the last 10 years, they've been ATSs. And in ATSs, there's so much bias in ATSs that it kind of dislodges things. So if you are doing it fair, I don't think you should have a tax on a robot. I think you should have a tax if you violated your rule. If you've done something that's been harmful to a group, you should have a penalty just like they do for people like Microsoft when they're cornering the market, you know, things of that nature. So, yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Yeah, let's see if we have any more questions or comments coming in. <clears throat> still have time for one more question if anyone attending wants to quickly quickly post your questions for Dr. Newton. Well, on behalf of Drew Stinnett and myself, we would like to thank you very much for listening to us and attending our presentation. We are here. Um, if you want to ask further questions or uh, Drew, what's your handle on LinkedIn? Uh, I think I am Drew Stinnett on there. I'll, uh, I'll paste a link in. Yep. A link in on LinkedIn. Exactly. And I am resigned uh, on LinkedIn. Uh, I don't have any other social media. Um, I don't believe in that because anything free is not necessarily good for you. So 
no Facebook and Instagram and all that good stuff, but I am on LinkedIn. So we want to thank you very much for allowing us to chat with you today. And uh, we wish you well and success in your career and your endeavors. Thank you again.